Okay, I think we can start. So thank you all for coming to this Thursday afternoon seminar. So today we have with us Pierre Auclair from the University of Paris, and he will tell us about paramodal black holes from metric preheating. So thank you, Pierre, and you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to present you this, uh, this paper that we put on archive today. So here is the archive link if you want to look at it while I'm speaking, um, which is on primordial black holes from metric preheating. And we take the approach on um, calculating the mass fraction uh, more precisely with the excursion set approach. And the outline of the talk is the following. So first I will give a very brief introduction on uh, matters that I'm sure you all know, like inflation and also the the phenomenon of parametric instability that is at the basics of the predicting instability that I will present uh, later on. And then I will have a short section about the physics of the metric preheating. Uh, I mean, the preheating instability and the metric preheating. And then I will have uh, a big part. So here are the three sections here on how to calculate the mass fraction of parameter back holes that result from this preheating instability. And uh, uh, yes, and spend more, a lot of time on this. And at the very end, I will apply these tools that uh, I will present on the calculation of the primordial black holes from metric preheating and uh, give some conclusions about the masses of these black holes as well as, uh, as their abundances. Okay, so now for a very uh, general introduction, uh, at the basics of all of this, of course, is inflation. Uh, so I'm sure you all know inflation. It's a period of exponential uh, expansion that solves various problems of the standard model of cosmology. Uh, when I say that, of course, uh, in your definition of the standard model of cosmology, you may include inflation, in which case you don't have these problems, of course. And inflation is basically this first moment here of um, uh, expansion of the universe uh, that solved the flatness problem, the horizon problem, and also the magnetic model problems. And it's um, a model that has been well tested, for instance, for through CMB experiments. And during this very rapid expansion, a phenomenon that uh, leads to observational signatures is the fact that you have quantum fluctuations that are stretched on uh, cosmological scales, uh, more, I mean, even super horizon scales, and that later on re-enter the upper horizon. And these quantum fluctuations may, I mean, have implications for large scale structures. They are also seen in the CMB, and they may also, when they re-enter the horizon and collapse into black holes, lead to the production of primordial black holes. And these are the objects that we are interested in today. Now, at the end of inflation, um, your inflaton field that drives this inflation um, usually uh, decays into standard model particles. And this phenomenon is called reheating, and you produce all the standard model particles through this mechanism. Um, now, the phenomenon that we are looking at today is something which is in between uh, inflation and reheating, that is called preheating. Uh, it's the phase in which your inflaton field uh, oscillates down its potential and does not yet decay into other particles. And the fact that it oscillates down its potential uh, leads to some uh, instabilities uh, that are well known that may produce and overproduce primordial black holes. So now the underlying phenomenon that, um, that is at the basics of all of this is the fact that you have a parametric resonance. So the simplest example would be here, what you see on this figure, the, the, you have a pendulum, uh, in which case you only have this part of the equation with the second derivative and uh, frequency square, and which is driven by another oscillatory term. So you have two oscillators coupled to each other. And when you have um, um, frequencies that are in resonance with each other, you may have solutions which are, uh, which are not bounded. And this is well known for this uh, forced pendulum here. And this is what is represented uh, like a, a bit abstractly with this figure that you see on the right hand side, in which the x axis is this frequency A here. And on the y axis is the amplitude of the force term. So when Q equals to zero, so on this axis here is just, um, um, just a, an usual, uh, a usual pendulum. And then you excite it with uh, another oscillator with um, with a frequency which is here uh, two, I mean pulsation two, and an amplitude which is uh, multiple of Q. And the region we are interested in, in this plot, so um, is, is this narrow region here. So all the blue dots that you see in this two-dimensional figure are the 
places where the solution to the Mathieu equation here is not bounded, where you have a, a parametric resonance. So you see it covers a wide range in this 2D space. And here in this region, which corresponds to uh, A equals to one here, you have, you experience a parametric instability. And here the delimitation uh, that I will prove in the next two slides here um, denotes a linear um, uh, region here the, in which the, the parametric resonance occur. Okay, so how do you uh, get a sense of what's going on here? So this is a topic that is uh, uh, quite uh, difficult. At, at least I'm not an expert on this. So what I will present is a very first order uh, um, and very rough estimate to calculate this. And it relies on the Floquet's theorem. So here you have um, an ordinary differential equation, linear differential equation, which uh, here um, is periodic with respect to time. And what Floquet's theorem tells you is that you can look for a solution which uh, are just the multiplication of a periodic function here, p, and with here um, um, an exponential term with a certain coefficient mu here, which is called the Floquet exponent. Okay, so in the limit where you have uh, just one oscillator, the solution is well known. It's just a cosine here with a phase and an amplitude. But when you try to perturb and add a little bit of, um, um, I mean, of driving to, to this and perturb around q equals to zero and a equals to one, you can look for solution which are basically the multiplication of uh, this exponential with your Floquet coefficient and of a cosine with a different phase. And if you include that into this Mathieu equation and neglect one term, but I will not go into that, you obtain this nice equation that has to hold for all times. And in particular, you have to, this equation has to hold for t equals to zero and t equals to pi over two. And you end up with these two sets of equation here where you don't know the phase. So cosine phi and sinus phi are not known. And to have non-trivial solution, this two-dimensional two system um, uh, as to have uh, a zero determinant. Otherwise, the solution would be just cosine equals to zero and sine equals to zero, and it's not something that you want. Okay, so, so the fact that you have this kind of solution implies here that your determinant has to be zero, and this gives you uh, uh, an equation for mu square. And this equation is quite uh, trivial, actually, because it's just a second order polynomial, and you can find the, the values uh, of mu or mu square, depending on the value of the, the, the frequency and the value of the, for, the amplitude of the forcing term. So this is very rough estimate. Uh, it does not hold uh, for arbitrary uh, when you go far from this point, but this gives you a, a good estimate for what happens in this instability band. And now, if you remember, this mu here appears at, in an exponential. So if mu square is negative, basically it adds an oscillatory term and your solution stays stable. So any mu square equal, uh, negative will describe stable modes. But on, to the contrary, if mu square is positive, it means that mu is a real number and that your solution is unbounded and uh, it is unbounded either for in plus infinity or minus infinity. And this is, these modes are what uh, produce this parametric instability. And here you can give a, get a sense of uh, where this domain of instability is simply by looking at where this mu is equal to zero. And if you put that in this equation, it's basically telling you that the delimitation is for Q equals to absolute value of A minus one, which is exactly this um, dark line that we see here. So it's a, good, um, it's a good approximate in this region here. Okay. And if you stay in the line where a equals to one, it also gives you the dependence on the amplitude of the of the pendulum that drives uh, that drives your other pendulum, and tells you that basically mu square is proportional to q square divided by four, so mu roughly equals to plus or minus q divided by two, and this value uh, that I've just shown uh, here quite roughly holds in the the scenario that we are going to explore, uh, which is the preheating instability. Okay, so this is for the prerequisite for the for the talk today. So uh, about parametric resonance and inflection. Now let's go to the matter at hand, which is the preheating instability. 
Okay, so uh, I guess most of you are familiar within, uh, with the model of inflation. Here is just a single uh, field inflation, which uh, follows the Klein-Gordon equation. And here you have the Friedman equation that tells you how the universe expand with uh, given this, uh, that this field dominates uh, in the universe. Um, now you may uh, have concerns about this potential here, but remember that what I'm looking at right now is the very last moment of inflation when uh, your, uh, poten I mean, the inflaton reaches the down of the potential. So to a good approximation, uh, you, whatever the potential is, uh, in this region, you will have something which looks like a quadratic potential. Uh, unless you have a fine tuning mechanism that kills this mode, and in which case you have uh, higher order uh, potential. But this is a good approximation to most uh, inflationary models you have with uh, here a single scalar field. Well, you can solve Klein the, the coupled Klein Gordon and Friedman equations uh, numerically, which is what you see on the right hand side. Uh, so you have something which is expected that your scalar field here basically drops to, to zero and then oscillates with a certain damping around it, the bottom of its potential. And at the same time, if you track the equation of state uh, here, you see that it's constantly minus one during inflation, so which is something that is uh, well known. And then after, when the when the inflaton oscillates, it, you also have an equation of state that oscillates, but with mean zero. So on average, uh, when you average out these oscillations, you have uh, this region, or, I mean, during preheating, um, a scaling which is uh, like a matter era domination. So this region where you, you have your scale of that oscillate that its potential and is not decaying into particles drives this, um, this expansion like a matter era. So this is something important for the, the matter today. Okay, and now going back to this parametric instability, um, the, the, to get with the analogy with um, what I've presented earlier, you have, where you have a forced uh, pendulum, here is the pendulum, uh, what acts as a pendulum is the mukhanov sasaki variable, which is a gauge invariant combination of fluctuations in the scalar field and in the metric components. And this mukhanov sasaki uh, when you write the equation of motion in Fourier space, it looks like an oscillation, uh, I mean, an oscillator with a term here. And the fact that your uh, inflaton oscillates down its potential and means that the scale factor undergoes also oscillations. And you can basically rewrite this equation as a Mathieu equation with a certain A and a certain Q, which are expressed down there. And for modes here, um, I mean, okay. Um, so really the, the analogy is that the forcing term is your inflaton oscillating down your potential and the pendulum is this mukano sasaki variable. And when you look at these two quantities here, uh, the condition that they are within the instability band that I presented earlier is something like this. The, to imp impose that uh, A of K is comprised between one minus Q and one plus Q. So if you take only the upper bound here, it translates into a condition of the commoving wave number, that the commoving wave number has to be uh, below this quantity, uh, square root of three, uh, the Hubble parameter and mass here. And on the right hand side, here is the number of e folds where the dark, the sorry, the, the red line here shows the end of inflation. This condition basically uh, draws this orange line here. Now from a, a Floki analysis, which I've done very roughly in the introduction, but uh, also when you do that numerically, uh, you can also calculate how the mukhanov sasaki variable scales. So you can write here the, I mean, if you plug in in this equation, the fact that mu uh, depends slowly on time and is roughly equal to Q to divided by two. And you express it uh, here, the fact that it's, it's equal to the exponential of the integral, where z acts as a cosmic time times a mass. Basically, you find that this term is proportional to a to the power of three, per, three hour. And basically tells you that the mukhanov sasaki variable uh, basically scales like the scale factor. Okay, so on super horizon, I mean, on super Hubble scales, uh, that's uh, not very important. It just tells you that the, your um, um, 
that uh, it does not see the oscillations of the uh, of the inflaton, but on sub-level scales, if you look at the density contrast here, uh, you see that the density contrast also scales like the scale factor. And this is quite important. So the instability band is basically what's uh, in between those two curves here. Here is the fact that you have uh, you are in, into the instability band, and the blue line basically tells you that the mode is within uh, the Hubble horizon and starts feeling the oscillation of the inflaton. And um, a fixed co-moving um, uh, wave number is uh, denoted by this uh, blue dashed line that you see here that basically escape the Hubble horizon during inflation and then at some point re-enter uh, from above and then experience this uh, instability. And in this instability band, which is in between those two curves, your scalar field in homogeneities basically behave like pressureless matter fluctuation in a pressureless matter universe. And it turns out that uh, we know um, how much time does it take to these, for these um, um, inhomogeneities to form a black hole. And it is given by this formula here. Okay. So another density of, of a certain size takes a certain time to collapse. And the requirement to form a black hole is basically that this collapse, collapsing time is, is uh, shorter than the duration of the instability. So here you have a model which depends only on two quantities. Basically, the time of the, I mean, the time of the energy scale uh, at the end of inflation and the energy scale at the end of the instability, uh, which is denoted by a factor of gamma here. So the, the condition that uh, this time of collapse is shorter than duration of the instability gives you a threshold here on the density contrast to form a black hole at a certain scale. Okay, so this is for the physics of the creating instability. So you have uh, during this instability band, you have modes that behave like matter in a matter dominated universe, and modes that re enter the Hubble horizon are quite likely to form primordial black holes. But the question is, how many primordial black holes do, does this produce? And this is a non trivial question, especially when you want to understand exactly what is the di distribution of them. This is why in this uh, section here, I will review the, one of the classical formula that is used to do this calculation, which is the Presschester formula. And then I will uh, explain why, what are the limits of such a formula and try to go beyond with the excursion set mode. Okay, so the basic idea uh, is that uh, in the universe here, so here is just a 2D slice, you have a density field, which has uh, ups and downs, so a region of space where it's uh, concentrated and re region of space where basically you have voids, which, which would be these uh, holes that you see here. Um, now to understand, um, uh, the, I mean, the coarse graining procedure is basically to uh, take a patch of a certain size and uh, average your um, density contrast on this, uh, on this patch, which is this formula that is written here where W is a window function. Um, so in principle, what you would like in real space is having a, a top hat function here that basically selects a disk in 2D or a sphere in 3D uh, or a ball rather uh, and average over this ball. So the procedure, the procedure acts as the following. So on the right hand side, you have here a, a disk, which is in, in dark here. And you, uh, the height of the disk is basically the average or on this disk. Okay, and you track as you modify the, the, the size of the patch here, what is the average uh, on this disk of the density contrast. So then you reduce the size of this patch here. Here you see that when you are localized around this peak, basically it increases. And then you can go on shorter and shorter scales like this and obtain a trajectory for uh, the density contrast in terms of the, um, the scaling that you see here. And as you can imagine, as you go to a peak here, for instance, it would basically uh, plateau. Okay. So the procedure here is, is that you take a random point in space, which here, just for the purpose of illustration, is localized on the peak, but it does not have to be. And you look at patches of various sizes, and you look at whether on the typical size you have uh, enough uh, density to form a black hole. Okay. So. Uh, when you go more into the Preschester uh, formalism, which was described first by Preschester in 1974, 
what you are interested in are the statistical properties of your coarse brain density field. So when you go to Fourier space, uh, this formula that I've presented earlier here, which is basically a convolution, uh, becomes just a product in Fourier space, which uh, allows us to do uh, simpler calculations. Where you have here the density, I mean the coarse grain density, and you look at its um, Fourier the, um, transform, is directly proportional to the Fourier transform of the density field, which is something that usually you know very well because it comes from your infl inflation model, or in the case of large scale structure, when it was described, it comes from uh, the uh, physical model. And here, all of this quantity here is basically a window function in Fourier space. And an assumption that is uh, usually made, that we made in the numerical analysis and, uh, and, uh, and it usually made in the literature is to take this window function to be uh, a kind of a window, a uh, top hat function, but in Fourier space, which in real space is a um, since cardinal function, but uh, qualitatively, it does not modify much the results. Uh, Okay, so now you know quite well the statistical properties of your uh, density contrast, which uh, if it is a Gaussian uh, random variable is only parameterized by its two point correlation function that you see here. And the quantity that you usually have in at hand is this uh, power spectrum um, given in logarithmic units of K um, that you know from uh, your inflation model. Now, when you try to calculate the two-point correlation function of these, your Gaussian random variable, uh, I mean, the variance of, of it at a certain scale, you obtain this formula here, where here appears the window function. OK, so this uh, coarse-grained density field, um, it has mean 0, of course. But you know, uh, I mean, it's. Um, a superposition of various Gaussians, so you know it, it has Gaussian statistics, and you know its variance here. So you can uh, look at the statistical properties of this coarse grain field if you know how to calculate this quantity on the right hand side. Um, now I, sh I should also stress that there is a bijection, um, usually between the scale of the batch R and the variance of it. So you should see it as if you average over a very large uh, volume, basically the whole universe, you have something which is quite homogeneous. But if you look at smaller patches, then you have you are more likely to have um, differences when you look at different patches. So when you uh, reduce the size of your patch, basically you uh, increase the variance uh, s of the of the density coarse grain density on this patch. So there's um, inverse. Um, uh, I mean, uh, the, you, you can either go, uh, I mean, use the scale uh, R or the variance S, and you will see later on when we go to the excursion set formalism, but that basically using S, uh, you can interpret the equations uh, having S uh, serve as a time. But I will go on that later on. Just remember that uh, in the next slides, uh, sometimes you can, uh, you have a bijection between the scale and the variance. Okay. So now that you know the statistical properties of the, the coarse grain density field, you can try to uh, build uh, a model to calculate the mass function. And so here uh, you have the, the probability distribution for the coarse grain field is basically a Gaussian with a certain variance uh, that we have calculated earlier on. Uh, and the probability at a given scale to be above this threshold is quite easy to calculate. It's just the, the um, the, the, the probability to have uh, a coarse grain density field above the threshold. And this is the probability to have uh, um, to have a primordial black holes precisely at the scale uh, uh, R. And this is more or less what is represented on the on the right hand side. Basically, uh, you have a Gaussian which starts, I mean, with zero variance on large scale, which is here. Then as you go to smaller scales, you have a certain disper dispersion that you see here. And basically to have a, bl a black hole uh, in, for instance, here, R equals to one, you basically integrate your density, uh, I mean, the density contrast from the barrier here uh, to, to infinity, which is what is given by this formula. And integrating this Gaussian, you obtain a error function. And now to obtain, so this gives you the, the probability to have a structure at sc uh, scale R, 
But the, if you want to calculate the number of collapsed objects uh, precisely in the scale r and in scale, I mean, between scale r and r plus del dr, uh, you have to take the derivative of this function. Okay, so this is more or less the physics behind the pressure shift formalism, but it has certain limitations that I will illustrate just right now. So the first limitation that is usually seen in the literature is that when you integrate uh, integrate this, uh, this quantity here from the minimal scale that you're looking at to infinity, basically you recover this error function, but with a factor of one half, which that comes here from this one half. And what that means is that uh, basically your uh, mass, I mean, the fraction of matter uh, that is gravitationally bound cannot be higher than one half, which is quite unsatisfactory because we expect that if you have very large uh, density fluctuations, basically to, to have all the universe fall into parameter black holes. But this is not something that you can have in the pressure shift formalism, which is bounded by one half. And this is why it has been uh, argued heuristically that uh, you should take this formula, pressure shift formula with a factor of two in the in front to recover, to have the possibility to have the whole universe fall into black holes or into the structure that you're interested in. But there is another limitation and which is illustrated on the right hand side when you take a single trajectory. So you fix a point in space and you look at the variation of this uh, density contrast across scales. And uh, it's not some, it's something that uh, receives random kicks each time you incorporate new modes. And it has a certain random trajectory like this. And it may happen, and actually it happens a lot, that um, so here you have the barrier away with the same uh, color scheme and here your trajectory. So on very large scale, you have zero. And then at some scale here, it goes above the threshold. So you expect to have a black hole here, uh, roughly this size. And then it goes beyond threshold and then above threshold again and below and here above. So this is all the gray regions that you see here. And also again, go a bit above this threshold. And it is quite unsatisfactory because if you look at the pressure shift formula, for instance, here, what you will see is that what uh, the pressure shift formula will tell you is basically that you have no black holes around this point at, at this scale. So the, the fact that you have at a certain scale a density contrast, which is below threshold does not mean that uh, it is not included into a larger structure. And when we look at parameter black holes, uh, we don't have substructures. It's always the biggest black hole that matters for us. Uh, it's not like in uh, for large scale structures when you can have clouds and then solar systems and then our different planets and, and so on and so on. Uh, so you have only the biggest object that matters. And which in this, in this re, I mean, for this trajectory would be in precisely this point here, this dashed line. So the bottom line is that this press formalism, uh, it always underestimates the number of collapsed objects. Because if you integrate this trajectory down to, uh, I don't know, this scale, for instance, it would tell you that you don't have uh, a black hole, which is, which is not true. And the way to see that is that actually what calculates the pressure shift formula is the flux across this barrier here. So it takes into account positively all these trajectories that enter, but it also allows trajectories to, um, to go out, in which case it subtract them. This is, um, the, the reason is that here you take the derivative. And it's not, um, I mean, it's a bit unsatisfactory and explains why here you have this factor of one half. It's because you have equal probability to, uh, to have over densities and over under densities. So if you allow trajectories to go out, basically the best you can do is have half the trajectories above and half the trajectories below, but you cannot do better than that. Okay, and this is the limit limitation behind, behind the pressure shift formalism that uh, is um, circumvented by the excursion set formalism. And the basic idea is that instead of looking at the statistical properties of it all, you, you look at the statistical properties of single trajectories, uh, if you want to look at it, and precisely to look at uh, this sort of diagrams. Okay, so now we understand that there's a hierarchy of collapsed objects that we want to understand, and this is usually called the cloud in cloud problem, and that is not taken into account in this pressure shift formula. And the basic idea behind the excursion set formalism is that basically all these trajectories are continuous. When you, if you have a certain over density at a certain scale, if you just go to a slightly smaller scale, then you have correlations between the two. And this correlation you can also calculate. And 
the fact that it's continuous tells you that um, going from one scale to another just amounts to uh, adding new Fourier modes, just the one in the little slice in between the two sizes that you are looking at. And these new modes are, um, are basically random kicks to your trajectory. So you have to interpret your trajectory as a random walk with random kicks that are given by the, by the, the power spectrum of the density contrast. And you can basically write it in terms of a large line equation that you see here, in which Xi here acts as a white noise in terms of the scale. And the reason why um, earlier I've uh, talked about the variance being like a, a kind of time is because you can rewrite this equation here in terms of the variance and have another white noise. Maybe I should have put a prime here. And basically here, the, the variance acts as time with uh, just a white noise on the right-hand side. So really you should, uh, the excursion set formalism is just treating the, uh, I mean, translating the problem into the study of uh, random walks. And in particular, uh, the, on this, once you have one random walk uh, and that it has multiple crossing with the collapse criterion, these multiple crossings basically denotes the hierarchy of structures that I've mentioned before. So a big structure containing smaller structures and, and so on and so on as you go to smaller scales. But what we're interested in are the largest collapse objects. And uh, this as a name in terms of Langevin equation, is, which is the distribution of first crossing. So the whole idea behind the excursion set formalism is to study this first crossing distribution and then translate it into um, a mass fraction for the primordial black holes. And here it is first passage time that gives these um, index here FPT uh, is this, uh, this distribution is the, what we want to calculate. So here you have a sample of trajectories. So the brute force approach is basically to, uh, to simulate uh, millions and millions of trajectories, which is something we've done to check our results. And it's quite um, ineffective uh, as, we, as I will show you later on and look at the first time uh, at which these trajectories cross your uh, boundary. So here for this blue line, it would be denoted by this dashed line here. So where this trajectory is just one of, of this, just to see, to, to, to show you uh, for a single trajectory. Okay, so now we have a method to calculate the first uh, passage time, which is simulating a bunch of trajectories, but it's not very efficient. And we can go, we can do better. And this is the approach that I will present in the next three slides, which basically rephrase the problem in terms of Vol Volterra integral equations. Okay. So just to fix the notations, uh, if you have this equation in absence of any boundary, then your coarse grain density field um, um, evolves with a certain dispersion, uh, as I presented earlier on. And uh, if you fix a scale, so a certain value of the variance and a certain value of the density contrast, if you look at another scale, which is uh, below, you have the probability to jump from one to the other is given by this uh, distribution that we call P3 because it does not depend, uh, it's in the absence of boundary conditions. And it's something that is well known and it's just given by this, uh, this Gaussian. Now uh, I will just derive two more equations that are sufficient for the, to derive the Volterra integral equations. And they are uh, quite easy to understand. It's just that, um, so the first one is just to say that at a given time, uh, any trajectory either has crossed the boundary uh, previously, so at a time which is earlier on, and this gives you this term here. So either your trajectory has uh, crossed before or it is still below the, um, uh, the boundary, in which case it, has a it is a probability to have a density smaller than uh, the threshold here. And here, notice that there is no free here. It's, um, uh, here is probability is in the, uh, in the presence of this boundary. Okay, so you have this first equation, which is quite simple to understand. And the other one, um, is uh, basically relating this uh, free function and uh, the, the real probability distribution. So the probability to have a certain um, um, uh, over density at a scale is the same as the probability of uh, arriving at this scale uh, freely without the boundary minus the probability to have crossed the boundary first at a certain time. 
And this is what is given here. So here is just the probability to have across the boundary at the time s, small s, and then to have jumped from this point to the, the last point. OK, and when you manipulate these two equations, you obtain, finally, this very nice uh, Volterra integral equation, uh, which looks maybe difficult, uh, but which is actually quite simple to solve numerically. So the first passage time, which is the variable we want to estimate, is written on the left-hand side here, but it's also present in this integral here on the right-hand side. And um, it's not, uh, I mean, you cannot translate that easily into uh, an ordinary differential equation. Okay, so this is already a nice result, and most of the papers on the literature will stop there, but actually um, you can go a bit further. And by noting that this following equality holds, and one, what this uh, equality states is that basically the probability to be at the boundary, precisely at the boundary, hence this um, uh, index C here at the given scale means that you have already crossed the boundary uh, earlier on. That's, that's for sure. And it, it just tells you that uh, to be on the boundary at a certain point, you need to have crossed the boundary at an earlier point or, or just now. So it's just uh, the probability to, to cross at the small s and then to propagate to, uh, to this point. And actually, if you look at this equation, it fits not nicely into the, the above equation. You can basically multiply by any function of uh, small, I mean, of big s, and it will enter in the equation, just like this. And this holds for any function k of s. And we will see why it's important. So you have this equation and numerically it's not that hard to solve and uh, this is just what I will show right here is that if you discretize time so this uh, variance s in terms of um, equally spaced uh, uh, intervals uh, you can basically translate this problem into just a problem of linear algebra where these p f p t and x are just vectors because they depend only on big s and where this matrix here is the argument, the kernel of this um, um, integral and depends on two variables. So here it's just a, a matrix. But if you look at uh, the, the boundaries of this integral here, uh, okay, so here is a big S, sorry for that. Uh, basically what it says is that uh, this matrix is lower triangular. So it's quite easy to invert. And it has a non-zero cells only, uh, well, yes, it's lower tri triangular. And here you have this um, unspecified function k that holds for any, um, uh, that k, I mean, that you can set to whatever you want. And here you see, maybe you start to see what the problem is. Uh, in principle, the diagonal of this matrix is divergent. Uh, this is because here, when you let n go to m, uh, this term gives you a d prime, um, uh, a barrier prime, so delta c prime. But here you don't have zero. You have something which is uh, non-zero. And but here your Gaussian basically becomes infinite. So you have something quite weird appearing. And if you want to solve it, uh, you have to enter into weird um, averaging procedures around the diagonal. But the fact that you allow here your function k to be completely whatever you want in terms of s, you can basically specify that it's the derivative of, um, of delta c and put it inside. And in which case, here, this argument will basically cancel uh, when L equals to M. So you can choose a, a, a function K here, which has an impact, of course, on the vector X here, that makes your, mat your matrix here uh, completely um, well-defined, especially under your diagonal. And if you do that, uh, you just end up uh, inverting this very simple uh, matrix, uh, identity minus this matrix M, and you converted the problem of simulating millions and millions of trajectories into just a problem of inverting a matrix, which is, uh, as you may imagine, quite faster. Just to give you a rough idea for us to obtain a single mass function, uh, it, it is more than a thousand times faster. So it's not something that you can uh, just discard. Okay, so we've described this nice uh, a new procedure, which is uh, quite nice, but maybe depends a lot on numerical uh, calculation, which is maybe unsatisfactory if you want an integral approximate. But we will see what the relationship between the pressure shift formula and the excursion set formalism is uh, in this section. So we just three slides. 
So here is just a summary of the two approaches. So the first, the pressure shift formalism is just calculating the flux across a boundary. It allows modes to enter, but it also allow, allow uh, trajectories to go out, and in which case it subtracts them. So here you have the PS here for pressure star. And um, this formula, I've not given the explicit formula above, but it's just the derivative of the error function and is, is given by this formula that you see here. Now, the excursion set formalism uh, only tells you what are the largest bound structures. And it, the formula is quite uh, more heavy in some sense. Also, it's not completely direct. You have to solve it numerically. But there are two cases, two scenarios in which uh, you can relate the two quite easily. You have the scenario in which the threshold is scale invariant. Maybe you already see what the result is. And you also have the scenario in which the threshold decays rapidly, which is maybe less obvious. So first, if you, allow, if you tell that the, scale, the, the, the threshold is completely scale invariant and does not depend on a scale or this time here, well, all the terms in red basically go to zero, all the derivatives of this, of this threshold and also the differences of this threshold. And um, basically, you recover the same formula, but here with a factor one half. And uh, maybe you remember the first slides that are presented on pressure uh, formalism. This factor one half what was bothering us at, the, at first, the fact that you cannot have all the universe falling into black holes, but only half of the universe. And here, it, here is the, in the case of uh, scaling by a threshold, the fact that you put a factor of two completely heuristically in front of the formula uh, actually works quite well. And we understand it from the, from the formulas. So this proves that the pressure to a formula corrected by a factor of two becomes uh, exact in the case of a scale invariant threshold. Okay, so now let's look at uh, another limit. Uh, which is the case in which you have a very red threshold. So a uh, threshold that decays very quickly. And maybe you can already see what's going on. Uh, and I don't show the full, um, the full demonstration. But basically, if your threshold uh, decays faster than the noise, the dispersion of delta R, say, let's say you start here, then the multiple crossing uh, becomes quite unlikely because uh, it's very unlikely for your trajectory to uh, get out of this gray region, which is the dispersion of delta R. So your trajectory is basically trapped inside the boundary and cannot escape. So this prevents multiple and crossing events to happen. And it makes the formula, I mean, the pressure to formula exact without this factor of two. So this is another, uh, completely other limit in which you recover pressure to formula without the factor of two. And uh, just to uh, give you a bit of um, uh, subtleties on this, on this um, as you can imagine, since the barrier here is defined, uh, here you have a derivative defined everywhere. But if you start your trajectory, uh, let's say here, the, the dispersion of delta r will go um, like the square root of s. So here you have a derivative which is uh, infinite. So you cannot prevent arbitrarily the, uh, the multiple crossing events on small scales, because the noise basically scales like the square root of delta s, while the drift and the barrier will scale like delta s. So uh, you cannot prevent multiple crossing events on very small sizes. And it's, this is why here you have this parameter epsilon, if you look more in details into the paper, that basically tells you what's the resolution you want on the mass function. Okay, because um, he, as you have a random walk, you are bound to have multiple crossing happening on very short scales. But if you say that you're interested only on, uh, I don't know, um, a resolution of one order of magnitude, for instance, then uh, you, you, you can cancel these multiple crossing events. OK, so this is it for uh, this long part on how to calculate the mass function. Uh, but now let's apply it to uh, the prime of the black holes for metric by hitting. And I would just add a little bit on the physics behind this. So we've seen that you have um, a density contrast, which basically scales like uh, uh, insolvable scales like uh, the scale factor. But we have to connect the dots between the super horizon modes and, uh, uh, and the sub horizon modes. And you do that, as you may know, with the curvature of perturbations, which are uh, uh, conserved on super uh, horizon uh, scales. And uh, so this density contrast uh, is linked with the Bardeen potential, but the relationship between the Bardeen potential and the curvature perturbation is not obvious. It's given by this 
uh, dynamical equation here. And we solved it numerically just to check that, uh, that it works. So you see here that this ratio is basically zero if you go down into uh, inflation. Actually, you can show that it's uh, given if you have the slow roll uh, by this um, function of the scale factor. But uh, if you solve it numerically after inflation and during these oscillations, uh, what you observe is that the ratio between the two is uh, oscillating around uh, basically three out, I mean, three fifths, and that the oscillations are quickly damped. Here it's not equal, it's really the cosmic time. So it's really decaying fast and uh, really decaying fast. And to a good approximation during the old uh, instability, you have uh, basically um, just a multiplicative factor between the paired in potential and the curvature perturbations. Okay, so now um, we take as a density contrast, uh, a density contrast exp expressed in terms of a commoving gauge. So this is this formula in terms of the Bardin potential and which you can relate to the curvature perturbations with this formula. And you can calculate the variance of uh, your coarse grain field, uh, basically knowing the, the, um, the curvature perturbations that are given by your inflationary models. OK. OK, so here is uh, a result for a mass fraction of PBHs. Uh, if you assume that uh, the, these typical values for the end of inflation and the end of the stability. And what you see in dark, the dark line here is obtained uh, by following a, a million trajectories uh, following this large line equation. Um, so as you may imagine, all these trajectories start at very uh, large masses, uh, so large scales, so small s and then propagate like this. So the statistics is very, becomes bad on the low end of the mass range. And these error bars were estimated using a jackknife resampling. This red line that basically superimposed with the dark line is by solving numerically this Volta integral equation, which is, as I mentioned, is more than a thousand times faster. And then you have uh, other lines. So in blue, you have an analytical approximation that we put in the paper, but I thought it would be too heavy to put it in the presentation now if I want to um, stay in schedule. Uh, and in green line, you have also an the, the, the peak mass, which we have also estimated analytically in the paper. And in, in gray here is just to show you uh, how we estimate the width of the distribution. Uh, so it's a width in terms of logarithmic units. And that tells you uh, how spread your um, mass fraction is. So now that we have this mass fraction for a given value of uh, rho n and rho gamma, we can calculate it basically for any value. And what we obtain is the following picture. So here you have uh, rho n, so the density at the end of inflation, and rho gamma, which is the density, the energy density at the end of the instability. And what you observe is something quite, quite sharp, actually. You have basically zero primordial black holes produced in all this region. And here you have basically the universe which is closed by primordial black holes. And if you take a slice at a um, fixed uh, energy density for the end of inflation, you see that the transition is very sharp. You go from zero to one quite rapidly in just one or two of the magnitude. And, the, um, uh, and the, the red line is the excursion set approach. Now, uh, something that I've not mentioned is that uh, in this precise model, you can show that we have a certain uh, set of variables that you can um, go back to a threshold, which is basically scale invariant, in which case you can, you can use this two times pressure uh, formula that I've presented. Uh, Hi, Pierre, are you there? Can you hear us? Well, I can, but I'm not the Pierre you're thinking of, I yes. think. Not you, the other one, the speaker, yes. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, ah. can, you, can you repeat? Because you, you froze a bit for a few seconds. OK, uh, I was already on this slide, right? Uh, you were in the previous, I think. Oh, this one? Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. That's my connection. At home. Yeah, it's, it's OK. okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. OK. Um, so what I was mentioning is that uh, you have region of space where basically you have zero uh, for uh, the amount of energy contained into primordial black holes. And if you take a slice here, you see that you go very rapidly into one. 
and you have a very short transition, which in terms of this unit is on only one order of magnitude, roughly. And um, you see here, so uh, I don't know if you heard it, sorry if I'm repeating myself, but you can show that with a certain set of uh, uh, stating the problem, you can have a threshold, which is basically scale invariant, in which case the two times pressure step formula works quite well, as you may see here. Okay, and we can go to the details of this distribution uh, and look at the average mass and the dispersion that I've mentioned earlier on. And when I say average mass, it's more like the exponential of the average logarithmic mass, just to see uh, in, when you put logarithmic units where the peak is, the position of the peak. And you see here that we range basically from 10 grams to roughly a solar mass. So this, these are pretty light black holes that may evaporate through Hawking evaporation. And on the right hand side, you have the width of this distribution. So this is the gray region that I presented two slides before, which is basically the dispersion in terms of logarithmic units. And you see that you have basically distribution that do not are not wider than two orders of magnitude. So it's it's rather wide, but also not that wide. It's uh, still pretty localized, especially when you compare 10 grams to solar mass. Okay, so now I reach my conclusion. So I want to convince you that parametric instability occurs in any inflationary model in which you have an inflaton that oscillates around the minimum of its potential. It's quite generic uh, and depends only on two parameters, the energy density at the end of inflation and the energy density at the end of the instability. Um, this metric preheating leads to the amplification of a wide range of scales, basically all the scales that enter the instability um, during its duration. And the fact that you have cloud in cloud plays an important role. And here we used basically the excursion set formalism with various numerical techniques. So um, uh, simulating large line trajectories, um, uh, solving Volterra integral equations, uh, and also an integral approximations uh, that we've tested to calculate this max function. And basically what we end up is a criterion that tells you what is the region of parameter space where the PBHs are abundantly produced. In the paper, we, we also have a formula that I, not, uh, that I did not mention here that tells you basically the mass of these primordial black holes uh, from these parameters. And as you may imagine from this picture here, this mass can be uh, slightly higher than the energy scale at inflation, because basically the energy scale at the end of inflation is given here and the peak mass is uh, several orders of magnitude above. So, um, so it increases slightly the mass of the average mass of your primordial black holes that are produced. And all these primordial black holes are rather uh, light and they may evaporate through King of evaporation and produce rating by the, via this mechanism, in which case you don't need to have a coupling between the inflaton and your standard model particles. Uh, and it may also induce a detectable stochastic background of gravitational waves. And this is something that has been uh, shown in the paper, uh, in a recent paper by uh, Vincent and uh, Theodoros uh, and others uh, a few weeks uh, earlier. Okay, so I've reached my conclusion and maybe we can move on to questions if you have any. Okay, thank you for this uh, very nice uh, talk. So we are open for questions. Uh, so, Satiko, yes, you raise your hand. Hello, yeah, sorry. Uh, hi, Pierre, uh, thank you for the nice talk. I, I just wanted to understand, uh, or, sorry, if you mentioned already, but uh, what determines the mass of the primordial black hole, typical mass? Hmm. Um, so, uh... so here uh, you have several, uh, you have different things. Uh, so here basically would be the typical energy scale at the end of inflation. And then you have here uh, kind of an amplification, the longer the, the, the instability is. So uh, as the instability gets uh, longer and longer, uh, it allows for larger black holes to form. And uh, this is what shifts this, this peak here. And as a large black hole is produced, it is also likely to be produced on top of a smaller one. So it basically absorbs it. So you have a phenomenon that uh, the, la the longer the, tr the instability um, uh, stays, um, you have the, this distribution that shifts to the right hand side because the large black holes eat the small ones and basically shift the distribution on the right hand side. 
So it's a balance between the energy scale at the end of inflation and, and the uh, energy scale at the end of the instability. And uh, I cannot tell you exactly what the ratio is, but uh, you may find it, the precise formula in the paper if you want. Oh, OK, thank you. Any more questions? Pierre, you raise your hand. Yes, please. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. I really liked it. Um, so uh, I've got a question about maybe how to relate that with uh, constraints that we have on, um, on, on the existence and the abundance of PBHs. Uh, so first of all, if I understood correctly, the, the scenario that you propose is something that doesn't require any exotic phenomenon during inflation. Basically, if inflation stops at some point, which it better do, uh, you should produce a PBH in that in that manner. So is that is that correct? Uh, so first, I will correct correct you once. Uh, it's not. I have not proposed it. So people have done it before me. So, uh, but uh, it's just, I, I do, do not want to take credit for that. Uh, just um, yes. So uh, so it's slightly different. Uh, if you look here. So it's true that you don't need exotic phenomenon. You just need the inflaton to be uh, not um, uh, not decaying too fast into standard model particles. Uh, if you see here, basically uh, the quality between the end of the instability and the uh, end of inflation, basically you do not produce any black hole. You have to give the possibility for the inflaton to oscillate for a, a long time and to eventually produce primordial black holes. But you do not need to fine tune the, uh, your inflation model. It works with, uh, so here we've just taken uh, a simple, um, I mean, quadratic potential, and you can do that with any potential that you want. Uh, I may also uh, stress that um, all the code that has been used to produce this figure and do this calculation is online uh, with the, attached to the archive paper. So if you want to uh, use it and put any potential you want, you can basically uh, try it and, uh, uh, and, and I mean, test any model you want, of course. But so, wait, Juan, just, just one before, because this is uh, what I wanted to say. So with, um, given, given this figure that you're showing, that means that, uh, so because you've got the abundance of PBHs and their mass function, that means that in principle, uh, given the fact that, for example, we don't see too many uh, PBH of a mass that is below um, one sort of mass, let's say with, um, the constraints that we have from micro lensing in our galaxy, things like this. So from that, you can put constraints on the, uh, the parameters of inflation, basically. Uh, so uh, to be honest, uh, I'm not quite, uh, I mean, people, uh, I know that Juan, Juan and uh, Vincent know more about me on, on this matters, so I don't want to say anything stupid. Uh, but um, uh, I, I, what I understand is that the, um, the constraints are usually given in terms of when you have a, a single mass. So here you see that the, the mass function is quite uh, wide. You have two orders of magnitude. So I guess this relaxes some of the uh, uh, constraints, but you also have the fact that they are quite light and they all can evaporate quite rapidly. So I guess one of the uh, most important constraints comes from the fact that you do not want too much energy to be uh, in, uh, inserted into uh, BBN, for instance. Um, and, uh, but uh, I think uh, Vincent, I think is here and uh, Juan Garcia Bito know better than me on that. But in right. principle, yes, uh, you could uh, yeah. then go back to uh, constraining the duration of the instability. Well, so just a, a remark is that if we think, for example, of micro lensing, uh, so the, the constraints that would come from that, they actually integrate uh, the whole, the whole, a whole range of masses that is uh, below, let's say, uh, one solar mass. But this is, yeah, this was just this was more comments. But thanks, you, thanks very much for, for your answers. Any more questions, comments? I'd like to make a question. A uh, nice talk, okay. Thank you. very nice, Pierre. So um, indeed, the, the the comment you made before, I think it's very pertinent. You, have, you are assuming that you will be in the instability for quite a long time. And in fact, you can even estimate that. You, you already mentioned this in, in your uh, condition uh, later on, the ratio of, of densities at the end of inflation compared to the densities at which you reheat the universe. And there are so many orders of magnitude in the energy density. So I think it's something like 20 orders of magnitude, uh, which you can actually see here also in, in this ratio. No? Uh, that it's very unlikely that the instability would last that long. 
I mean, not only do we expect that the couplings of the inflaton to the rest of matter would be enough that it would reheat within a few efforts. We don't have to wait so many efforts like uh, you're, you're assuming here. So the fluctuations grow during those efforts all the way to become enough to, for uh, the collapse of primordial black holes. But actually there is another issue, which is the back reaction. Uh, not only do you have fluctuations that grow in the metric that will produce a uh, fluctuation field that will collapse to form black holes, but the back reaction also changes the effective mass of the of your inflaton very quickly. It makes that mass so so large that the 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 inflaton very quickly goes to, to the minimum. So even though it is true that it looks like if it's constantly oscillating back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, instability going on and on and on and on, it doesn't last that long. It's just a, a few hundred oscillations at most. And in 100 oscillations, the energy density doesn't drop that much. So in practice, there are no black holes formed at all. This is my uh, take of the, of the model, unless you have uh, a different impression. Um, so I'm quite new to this, uh, to this topic. So I, I cannot answer you with a, um, a, a pertinent uh, answer on, on this, but it's true that um, Personally, I don't expect um, the model to hold uh, deep into this triangle. So, so that would be a first limitation in the fact that if you have uh, basically all the universe falling into primordial black holes, the, the description does not hold uh, anymore. So you would be, uh, I would say, uh, you would have to limit yourself at least to the, the hypotenuse of this uh, triangle in some sense. You, maybe you, you are not going that deep into the triangle that you have here, that's for sure. Uh, but concerning the, the effect that you mentioned, um, I don't have anything uh, pertinent to say about this. Maybe Vincent has or uh, someone else in the assembly, but uh, uh, I would uh, stay here. <laughs> yeah, so if I can just quickly jump in. So I guess I missed the part where you said uh, you, we need 20 orders of magnitude. So if you, if you only have five well, orders of, according to the formula that Pierre has uh, shown, if you only have five orders of magnitude. That's in mass, uh, Vincent, not, not in density. In density, your 20 orders of magnitude. So it's, of course, but it's, yeah. it's in energy, right? Uh, that's, that's not the relevant thing. The thing is how, it, how many, on, I mean, think of it in, in the rate of expansion, no? uh, yeah, sure, but which is proportional to density. You see, so if you say inflation proceeds at 10 to the 16 GV, so we have all the way between, say, I don't know, 10 or 100 MeV BBN until 10 to the 16 GV. And if reheating is at 10 to the 11 GV, that's already enough. It will never reach 10 to 11 if it starts at 10 to 16. That's well, the, it says who? Point. Okay, uh, one issue is this issue of back reaction that I mentioned. So if, if okay, you back reaction is another issue. No, no, it's it's important issue. So the yeah, point I, that I know, I know, but back but back reaction, I would so I think you're of course you're going. It's like it. you will have something like a hundred oscillations, and I think the number of efforts is like two or three. I mean, certainly not all the way to 10 to 11. Yeah, yeah, but if, I would say that if if, if a back reaction problem arises it means that you already have a substantial amount of black holes, right? Back reaction occurs if you have large fluctuations building up. Uh -huh. It may not be enough to produce a black hole. So that depends on, on how quickly you populate the small scales that have sufficient density within those scales to collapse to form a black hole. If you have a, a large amplitude, but this wavelength is large, you don't have enough density within that uh, given wavelength to collapse to form a black hole. So well, you can have back this... reaction from the low wave modes, Typically, you populate the long wave modes. No, but the um, reaction which would not collapse the form of a black hole. Yeah, yeah. But the enhancement is, is occurring on, on small scales. It's sub Hubble physics here. Nothing of course, I'm always talking about sub Hubble. I'm just saying uh, scales of order the horizon or smaller, not all the way but down. But they are not enhanced, those scales. The scales okay. which are enhanced are those which spend a lot of time inside the Hubble radius and they become deeper and deeper inside. I understand. But the back reaction comes from the long wave modes. And you're going to get a modification of effective uh, modification of the equation of state, for instance, of the of your inflaton field. At the minimum, it would get a very large contribution from phi square terms, which gives you an effective mass square, and this will will quench the the oscillation. But the um, but the large what reaction does. But the large wavelengths are not are not changed by that. They don't undergo any amplification. I'm talking about the the effect on the uh, on the scalar field. If, if you do put yes. this in, in the lattice, no? And you ask, okay, how does this fluctuations grow through preheating? So you have an amplification of modes. Those modes that are amplified 
will be the long wave modes within the horizon, of course, but still the long wave modes. And they effectively give you a mass term for your field. And this means that rather than staying on oscillating for a long time, it will make the mass work be very large and then the oscillation amplitude decrease very quickly. Yeah, but I guess the part that I miss is why do you say it's long wavelength modes? All of them are inside or deep inside the Hubble radius. They're inside the Hubble radius, but they're still long. This is Compared a to what? preheating. Preheating uh, is mostly a, an infrared problem. Uh, it's it's infrared. Yes, so before you Think go into the the femto details. Um, so, uh, it's a more, so for someone like me who uh, is more late universe and who knows shit about uh, inflation, I uh, can I ask this question to, uh, to Pierre. So uh, do we have actually any idea on, uh, you know, uh, so what would condition the, uh, the end of inflation in that sense? So uh, right, let's say the duration of uh, the end of inflation, this question of uh, how many orders of magnitude there could be, how much time we could have to form these black holes. Do you, so do you know anything about, about that? Uh, about the physics mechanisms that would lead to that? Mm. Um, I don't think I would. Um... Well, uh, if you, I mean, what what we observe uh, at least in CMB are the this uh, this power spectrum, but on, on scale that are no no match with this one because these ones are have already re-entered the horizon long before uh, CMB. Uh, but uh, right now, I, I I mean, I would leave the floor to uh, <laughs> to Vincent and Juan uh, on this precise question. I think. <laughs> Oh, don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, in any case, perhaps we can continue the discussion in private. It's getting a bit late. Uh, unless there is some other urgent question or comment that needs to be made. Okay, then if not, I think uh, we can thank Pierre again for this nice talk and for the, the rest of the people for this nice discussion. And thank you all for coming. Okay. Oh, uh, please don't shut it off so that we continue the discussion. Okay. Or that okay. is not interested in my simply. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Leave. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thanks for the invitation. Ciao.